Life has been full of challenges and some small wins. Losing my parents when I was young hit me hard, like a pain that never truly goes away. But I was lucky when the elderly couple next door, the Parkers, took me in. They were the kindest people you could ever meet. They treated me more like their granddaughter than someone they were helping. We didn't have a lot of money, but we were rich in love, and that was all that mattered. Just as I was turning 19 and thinking about college, the Parkers died in a car accident. Suddenly, I was on my own again. They left me a small amount of money for school and their house in the suburbs. It was a warm, cozy home filled with memories, but it had too many reminders of the past for me. So, I sold it and bought a small apartment in the city, close to the college where I had enrolled to study financial management. It felt good to have a plan and be moving forward. The classes were tough but interesting, and I worked hard to learn everything I could about numbers and markets. After college, I got a decent job. My days were filled with work, and I was doing okay, but the nights felt different. Even though the city was full of people, it felt strangely lonely. That's when I met Peter at a friend's party. He was loud, funny, and didn't care who noticed. His energy was contagious, and we clicked from the moment he bumped into me and spilled my drink. Hey, watch it. I snapped, more surprised than upset. My bad. Let me make it up to you. What were you drinking? Peter grinned without a hint of guilt. Just beer, I said, trying not to smile too much. Two beers coming right up, he shouted over the music, heading to the makeshift bar. That was Peter, simple, straightforward, and no drama. We spent the entire night talking about everything and nothing. We both loved old movies and hated sushi. Talking to him was easy, and by the time the party ended, I didn't want to say goodbye. Two years later, he proposed. There were no grand gestures, just the two of us watching TV when he pulled a ring out of his pocket. Marry me, he said, holding onto the ring tightly. I thought he might crush it. I laughed, not because it was funny, but because it was just so us, perfectly imperfect. Yes, of course, you big goof, I said. Getting married didn't change much at first. We were still the same people, just now officially tied together, which felt right. We settled into life in my small city apartment, still close to the busy streets but now with someone to share the quiet moments. Life felt fuller, and for the first time in a long while, the nights didn't feel so lonely. Being married brought a sense of comfort, but life has a way of keeping you on your toes. Jack's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Scott, were wonderful people. They lived in a cozy suburban home and welcomed me into their family from the start. I could see where Jack got his easy-going nature. Their warmth was a bomb for my heart, which still ached from losing my own family. We're so happy you're part of our family now, Mrs. Scott would often say, squeezing my hand with such kindness that it was both comforting and a little overwhelming. Thank you. I really appreciate how welcoming you've been, I would reply, feeling genuinely grateful. Visiting them became our weekend routine. Those days were filled with backyard barbecues and long chats over coffee. Life was good, simple, and honest. But then, everything changed. Jack was called away for a long business trip, he would be gone for a whole year. It was a fantastic opportunity for his career, but the timing couldn't have been worse. Just after Jack left, Mr. and Mrs. Scott's health started to decline, and it happened fast. One day, Mrs. Scott called me, her voice filled with worry. Laura, I hate to ask, but I could really use your help. Mr. Scott is not doing well, she said, her voice thick with emotion. Without thinking twice, I packed a bag and headed to the suburbs. Seeing Mr. and Mrs. Scott so frail shook me. Mr. Scott, who had always been strong and steady, now looked so small, connected to tubes and machines. I quickly settled into helping around the house, cooking, cleaning, and doing whatever needed to be done while Mrs. Scott focused on caring for her husband. In the evenings, I would sit with them, reading aloud from Mr. Scott's favorite books. He would often close his eyes before I finished a chapter. Thank you, Laura, he'd whisper on the good days, his voice just a shadow of what it used to be. It's my pleasure, really, I'd say, gently squeezing his hand 
trying to offer comfort in the little ways I could. One quiet afternoon, while I was chopping vegetables for dinner, Mrs. Scott sat down at the kitchen table. She looked older than usual, the weight of everything clearly wearing on her. Laura, I don't know how to say this, but we're in a bit of a tough spot, she started, nervously wringing her hands. Mr. Scott had always been the one providing for their household, and with him in such poor health, Mrs. Scott was clearly stressed. I put down the knife, giving her my full attention. We're struggling, honey. I hate to even ask, but would you consider renting out your apartment? It might help us get through this rough patch, she said, looking down, clearly embarrassed. I didn't hesitate for a second. Of course, Mrs. Scott. I'll take care of it right away, I reply firmly, wanting to ease her burden as much as I could. The apartment rented out quickly, and every month I made sure to send the rental money to Mrs. Scott, along with enough to cover groceries and bills. It wasn't easy, the commute to my job in the city was a nightmare, but I kept telling myself that family sticks together no matter what. You're a godsend, Laura, Mrs. Scott would say tearfully every time I handed her the money. It's what family does, I'd respond, though there were nights when I lay in the guest room, listening to the distant sounds of the city, feeling like the weight of the world was on my shoulders. Jack's phone calls were my lifeline. Even though the connection was often bad, hearing his voice kept me going. How's it going, Joyce? Are you holding up okay? His concern was always clear, even through the static of a long-distance call. We're managing. Don't worry about us, I'd say, trying to sound cheerful, not wanting to add to his worries. Life at the Scott's house changed drastically when Lauren, Mrs. Scott's daughter from her first marriage, showed up out of the blue. The whole atmosphere shifted the moment she arrived. She had a presence that felt like a cold wind sneaking in under the door. I didn't know Lauren very well, but Jack had mentioned her a few times, and I had seen enough during her brief tense visit to know that her relationship with Mr. and Mrs. Scott was strained. My days were already long, juggling work and caring for Mr. and Mrs. Scott. Mr. Scott was bedridden and getting worse, and Lauren's arrival only added more stress. She moved in like she owned the place, making herself at home without a second thought. One evening, after an especially hard day, Mr. Scott motioned for me to come closer. His voice was weak, a strained whisper. Laura, you need to watch out for Lauren. She's not a good person, he said, his words making my stomach not with worry. I understand, Mr. Scott. I'll be careful, I promised, though I wasn't exactly sure what I was supposed to be careful about. Mr. Scott's warning didn't take long to make sense. Lauren quickly made her intentions clear. One morning, I found her in the kitchen, her presence dark and cold like a storm cloud. Just so we're clear, she said, her tone sharp, I'm not here to play maid or cook for anyone. She sipped her coffee, eyeing me like I was in her way. I felt like an outsider in her mother's kitchen. Lauren's presence made it clear that I was not welcome, but I tried to stay calm. Okay, Lauren, I've been taking care of things so far, and I can keep doing it, I said, hoping to keep the peace. Good, because I don't plan on lifting a finger. This is mom's house, after all, she snapped back, her eyes daring me to say otherwise. From that day on, Lauren made sure everyone felt her presence, and not in a good way. She would order takeout just for herself and her mom, leaving the empty containers on the table for me to clean up. Her attitude wasn't subtle, and it hurt, but I kept quiet because Mr. and Mrs. Scott needed peace. One evening, Mrs. Scott spoke up. Laura, why don't you sit and eat with us tonight? There was a rare warmth in her voice, and for a moment, it felt like the old days were back. Before I could answer, Lauren quickly cut in. Mom, Laura has been busy all day. She probably prefers to eat later. Her words sounded concerned, but the message was clear, I wasn't welcome at the table. The days felt heavier as my chores doubled. Lauren's entitlement filled the house, and she often whispered to her mother at night, likely turning her against me. Mrs. Scott, once kind and understanding, began to change. Her smiles became fewer, her words colder. A couple of weeks later, Mr. Scott passed away. The funeral was a somber event, with Jack flying in just in time to say goodbye. 
It was the first time we had been together in months, and having him by my side brought a sense of relief. But even amidst the morning, I noticed a shift in the air at the Scott home. Lauren was on her best behavior, acting polite to everyone with a forced smile. How's everything been while I've been gone? Jack asked me quietly when we had a moment alone after the service. Fine. Everything's been fine, I lied, forcing a smile. I didn't want to add to his grief by telling him about the tension in the house. Are you sure? You look a bit worn out, he said, his brow furrowed with concern. It's just been busy, you know, helping out here, I reassured him, avoiding his eyes. This wasn't the time to unload everything that had been happening. As soon as Jack left, Lauren dropped the act. The mask of the caring sister was gone, replaced by her usual sneering attitude. The dynamic in the house changed completely. Mrs. Scott, perhaps consumed by her own grief, grew distant and cold toward me. She stopped having conversations with me, only giving commands, and I felt more like a stranger than a part of the family. Lauren took over the house as if she owned it, acting like the lady of the manor. Her reign was marked by complete disregard for anyone's feelings but her own. She started barging into my room without knocking, rummaging through my belongings as if she was searching for something valuable. One afternoon, I found her in my room again, and I knew things were only going to get worse. I was out in the garden, trying to find some peace, when I noticed a box lying among the shrubs. Curious, I opened it and felt my heart sink. Inside were my watches, jewelry, and even some of my underwear. Nearby, several of my dresses were carelessly thrown over a bush. Fury rose inside me as I grabbed my belongings, clutching the box tightly. I stormed inside and found Lauren lounging in the living room, acting like she owned the place. What the hell, Lauren? I demanded, my voice shaking with anger. You can't just throw my stuff out. Lauren laughed, a cold, harsh sound that echoed through the room. Live here? Please, you're just a guest, and not a welcome one. You should be out in the garden, or better yet, on the street. You're nothing but a useless beggar, anyway, she sneered. Her words stung deeply, like pouring salt on a wound. Trembling, I turned to Mrs. Scott, who had just walked into the room. Mrs. Scott, please tell her she can't treat me like this. This is supposed to be my home too, I pleaded, my voice breaking. But Mrs. Scott, once so kind and gentle, looked right through me as if I didn't exist. This is Lauren's house now, she said coldly. She's right, Laura. Maybe it's time you found somewhere else to live. Her words hit me like a punch in the gut. I stood there, clutching the box, my heart breaking. The home I had come to know, the family I thought I had, was falling apart in front of me. Despite everything, I stayed because of a promise I had made to Mr. Scott on his deathbed, to look after his wife and not let Lauren take control. But day by day, Mrs. Scott started to become more like Lauren. Her once gentle words turned sharp, and her eyes grew colder. One evening, as I cleaned up after dinner, she snapped at me. You're just sitting around doing nothing, aren't you? I'm doing my best to keep things running smoothly, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady despite how much her words hurt. Your best, she scoffed. Could have fooled me. Looks like you're just freeloading. She turned her back on me and walked away, leaving me standing there, feeling crushed. I was far from a freeloader, I had rented out my apartment and sent nearly all of the income to Mrs. Scott, and I was handling most of the housework while Lauren did nothing but criticize. Lauren, living off her mother's pension, was relentless. What does my brother even see in you, she would taunt me at night, her voice loud enough to echo through the thin walls. I would bite my tongue, swallow my anger and frustration, and remind myself of the promise I had made to Mr. Scott. The atmosphere in the house had become unbearable, filled with tension and hostility. One evening, I came home early from work and overheard a conversation that turned my world upside down. I walked in quietly, unnoticed by Lauren and Mrs. Scott, who were in the middle of a heated discussion in the living room. We need to get her to sell that apartment of hers. You know how much we could use that money, Lauren said, her voice greedy and calculating. Yes, but how do we convince her? 
Laura isn't stupid, she won't just hand it over, Mrs. Scott replied, sounding both frustrated and greedy. Leave it to me, mom. I'll sweet talk her into it. Once she signs it over, we can finally live the way we deserve, Lauren's words slithered through the air like a snake. Hearing them plot to take away my only financial security hit me like a punch to the gut. Fear gripped me. I knew in that moment I couldn't stay any longer. My heart racing, I slipped away to my room, unnoticed. They were planning to rob me of everything, and I had to leave before they could succeed. I made up my mind right then and there. Every second in that house now felt like a countdown to disaster. With shaking hands, I quickly packed my essentials. I didn't bother with goodbyes, they didn't deserve them. Slipping out the back door, I ordered a taxi to take me to the train station. As I sat on the train, doubts swirled in my mind. Would Jack understand? Would he take their side? The uncertainty was crushing, but the fear of what might happen if I stayed was worse. I stared out the window, watching the landscape blur by, a mix of fear and determination settling in my chest. When I arrived at Jack's place, his reaction was a mix of shock, relief, and concern. His eyes widened as he opened the door, seeing me standing there with a bag in hand, probably looking as frazzled as I felt. Laura, what are you doing here? Is everything okay? He asked, stepping aside to let me in. I hesitated for a moment, taking in the familiar and comforting sight of his temporary home. No, Jack. Everything's not okay, not at all, I replied, my voice trembling. He led me to the couch, his face now full of worry. Talk to me, babe. What happened, he urged gently. I told him everything. I explained how things had gotten worse since Lauren came back, how the situation at home had become unbearable, and how they were plotting to manipulate me into selling my apartment. I hadn't wanted to worry him while he was away working, but now there was no hiding it. As I spoke, Jack's face grew darker with every word I said. As I finished speaking, Jack's fists were clenched, and his jaw was tight with anger. Why didn't you tell me any of this before, he asked, his voice full of both concern and frustration. I didn't want to cause more trouble. I thought I could handle it, I admitted, feeling foolish now. Laura, damn it, you shouldn't have to handle something like that on your own, he burst out, standing up and pacing the room. I can't believe my mom and Lauren would treat you this way. He stopped and looked at me, his eyes intense. I'm not letting anyone treat my wife like that, no way. Without hesitation, he grabbed his phone. My heart raced as I watched him dial his mother. The phone barely rang twice before she answered. I couldn't hear her side of the conversation, but the way Jack's shoulders tense told me enough. Mom, this has to stop. I know everything, and I won't tolerate it. If Lauren doesn't leave, and if you don't start treating Laura with respect, we're done. No more help, no more money, nothing. Jack's voice was firm, leaving no room for debate. There was a fiery exchange and then silence. Jack gripped the phone tightly before speaking again. Fine. If that's your choice, then you've made mine. He hung up and turned to me, his expression softening. Looks like it's just us now, babe. But that's all we need, he said, pulling me into his arms. I leaned into him, feeling safe and supported. Just us, I murmured, feeling the truth in his words. We were on our own now, but somehow, that felt okay. Jack and I stayed up late, talking about everything, how we would manage without supporting his mom and Lauren, how I could arrange remote work, and what our plans would look like going forward. It felt like we were building a new life, just the two of us. Whatever happens, we're in this together. You and me against the world, right? Jack said with a determined smile. Right, I replied, smiling back, feeling more confident with him by my side. The next few days were busy. I arranged with my job to work remotely, which, thankfully, they agreed to. Jack helped me move my things out of storage, and we set up a little home office in the corner of his living room. It wasn't perfect, but it was peaceful, and it was ours. About a week into our new routine, I received a phone call that felt like a ghost from the past. 
It was Mrs. Scott. Her voice, once so sweet to me, now sounded harsh, filled with desperation and entitlement. Laura, why haven't I received the money for this month? You know we depend on it, she demanded right away, her tone sharp and accusing. For a moment, I was stunned silent by her nerve. It was unbelievable. I'm sorry, but after everything, you still expect me to support you? I asked, my voice more surprised than angry. In the background, I could hear Lauren's voice, sharp and angry. She's just ungrateful. Make her transfer the money. I took a deep breath to calm the anger rising inside me. Their cruel words replayed in my mind, words that had cut deep. Mrs. Scott, Lauren called me a useless beggar, remember? I'm not sending money to people who treat me like that. I'm done. There was silence on the other end, and I could almost imagine Mrs. Scott's shocked expression. But we're family, she finally said, her voice a mix of anger and desperation. No. Family doesn't treat each other that way. Goodbye, Mrs. Scott, I said firmly and hung up before she could reply. The call left me shaken, but Jack was right there, his support solid as ever. You did the right thing, Laura. It's time they learned to stand on their own, he reassured me, wrapping his arm around my shoulders. Not long after settling back into our hometown, another surprise came our way, I was pregnant. The news brought us joy we hadn't expected, and suddenly, the future felt bright and full of possibilities. We decided it was time to sell my apartment and buy a small house in the suburbs, somewhere close to a good school where our child could grow up. As we were planning the move, another call came, this time from Mrs. Scott. Her voice sounded different, desperate, almost pitiful. Laura, I've made a mistake. Lauren forced me to sell the house, took the money, and left me with nothing. Could I come and live with you and Jack, she asked, her voice shaky, pleading for help. This was a test of my resolve. Mrs. Scott, you chose this path when you sided with Lauren against us. You could have made a different choice, I said, keeping my voice steady despite the turmoil I felt inside. I know, I know. I've made mistakes, but you have a kind heart. Can't you forgive an old woman for her poor choices, she begged. I sighed, feeling a twinge of pity but also remembering all the hurt her actions had caused. I forgave you a long time ago, but that doesn't mean I can let you back into my life. You need to live with the consequences of your actions, just like I have, I replied and ended the call with a firm decision. I blocked her number. We continued with our plans and bought a charming little house with a garden, a place where our child could play and grow. One lazy Thursday morning, as I was flipping through the newspaper with my coffee, a headline caught my eye, local woman arrested for massive fraud scheme. I stared at the photo in disbelief. There was Lauren, handcuffed, looking completely defeated. I felt a mix of shock and, if I'm honest, a little sense of justice. Jack, look at this, I called, holding up the newspaper for him to see. It's Lauren. She's been arrested for fraud. Jack took the paper and scanned the article with a serious expression. Wow. I can't say I'm surprised, but still, it's a lot to take in. Yeah, it is, I agreed. But she made her choices, and now she's facing the consequences. As I said it, I realized it gave me a sense of closure I didn't know I needed. Eventually, we heard through friends that Mrs. Scott was living in a small apartment, working two jobs just to get by. Her pension wasn't enough to cover her living expenses, and the debt Lauren had left behind was crippling. Did you hear about your mom? One of Jack's friends, Frank, asked one evening when he and his wife came over for a backyard barbecue. Yeah, I heard, Jack said while flipping burgers on the grill, his voice holding a touch of sadness but also a sense of finality. She chose her path, Frank. It's tough, but that's how it is. Frank nodded, understanding there was no more to say. You're right, man. Just thought you should know. The conversation moved on after that, drifting to lighter topics like sports and work. Life had moved forward, and so had we. The real joy of our new life became clear when Kelly was born. Becoming parents changed everything. 
It shifted our priorities, our dreams, and even healed some of the old wounds by filling them with new love. Can you believe she's ours? I whispered to Jack one night as we stood by Kelly's crib, watching her sleep peacefully. She's perfect, Laura. Just perfect, Jack murmured, his voice thick with emotion. We spent our days marveling at every little milestone Kelly reached, each smile, each giggle. She was our little miracle, and with her, the struggles of the past began to fade, making space for new, happier memories. Each day was simple, filled with small moments of joy that slowly created the beautiful story of our happy family life.